First off, what is your niche? Now it's the main concept for your entire website. Your big idea of the whole site needs to have one core theme. And out of this, it's going to help you focus on who you will help and what you will help them with. Could be problem solution. It could be helping people who are passionate about a topic get deeper into said topic. Um, your niche is not set in stone. You can always change your niche. You can always pivot within your niche later. Uh, my wife and my big main brand based on my wife's content she creates, that niche has pivoted several times in our history, all under one brand. So all of the work we did at first, once we pivoted, that work still supports us to this day. For myself, I still have several niche websites that I built over the years that are still driving traffic, still bringing in some sales, I moved on from them, but it's okay to create a collection or a portfolio of niche websites. So really the goal is to get one great idea that you're willing to move forward with, blaze forward with, let's get some momentum. And remember, you can change your niche, you can start over again, you can pivot your niche, there's all kinds of options. This is not set in stone, so let's just make the best decision we can to get you moving forward. The goal of this training is to help you identify three possible niches you would really enjoy working in for a few years. We're going to help you compare the competition and the opportunity in each of these niches. So ultimately, you're going to be able to let the data combined with your personal kind of opinions and your personal goals and desires, right? So there's a little bit of data and there's a little bit of your personality. And out of those two things, your best first niche pops up and that's where we're getting you today. The niche selection idea is the most important step. You're going to need to work on this site probably for approximately a thousand hours. Now the average person should be able to get a thousand hours of work done on one site in about three to five years. Is it possible to speed that up? Absolutely. There are many ways through outsourcing, right? Hiring other people to do some work as a way to leverage more time on your asset. Or if you simply have more time available, you can definitely spend four, six hours per day and get through that thousand hour time period very, very quickly. So the average person, I would say, it's going to take about three to five years to create serious lifestyle success. So you need to be interested in the niche. It needs to be something that you're willing to show up for day in and day out, month in and month out for years and that's why it needs to be something that kind of at least ties into your personality but then we need to look at the data right because too competitive of a niche and you're never going to get traffic you'll never be able to stand out in too crowded of a marketplace on the other side of that coin if there's not enough search volume you're never going to be able to earn a lifestyle income because you're never going to be able to grow a big enough list and a big enough audience so we're looking for that sweet spot right in the middle for your personal niche and it needs to have a passionate audience of buyers and consumers i'm going to show you exactly how to find them in this training it needs to have low competition for your particular segment um, you'll understand more about segments here and what that means and i'll show you exactly how to find the competition numbers in part two and and then it needs to have a high value and demand for your content. Obviously, you're going to learn exactly how to identify that and figure all of that out here as well. So first off, there's three main types of niches. There's a passion niche, a lifestyle niche, and a problem solution niche. Now, the passion niches are really hobbies that kind of, they're on steroids, right? They're hobbies that have turned into obsessions for people. Fishing, golfing, horseback riding, woodworking, photography, all of these niches, and there are hundreds hundreds and hundreds more. These are the kinds of niches that when people really get into the sport or the hobby or whatever it is, they consume and buy everything. Photographers who are really, really serious about photography may very well have two or three different DSLR bodies. They'll probably have five to 10 different lenses for different applications. They'll probably have point and shoot cameras. They roll around with backpacks that have camera blocks in them. They have many different SD cards and right. They, it's a gear based game. Same with fishing and golfing. I would put bowling on this list. If you've ever seen a bowler who's really good at the sport, they'll roll up with eight different bowling balls. They got different wrist braces and shoes for different applications for different lane conditions. Horseback riding is another one from the boots, the helmets, the feed, the, the I mean, the property that you have to build and woodworking. There's so many woodworking tools required. You want a new jig that'll accomplish that. You need a new router for this. If you want to build that new style of table or that new style of fitting, you need these new dovetail routing things that I don't know anything about, but I've just seen woodworkers in my friends and family's spheres. Um, they're very passionate people and they buy lots of expensive things. 
things. So passion niches are full of people who buy new items to support their passion frequently. That's the key is that they're constantly buying new gadgets, new things, new tools to get better at that passion. Then there's the lifestyle niches. These are people who really truly self identify with an external activity. When you meet them in a coffee shop or a bar or something, they may very well say that this is who I am. So what do you do? Oh, I'm a parent or what do you do? I'm a vegan, right? What do you do? Oh, I'm a cyclist. And some people literally get to the point where they self identify. Now, where does the line between passion and lifestyle change? I would say that the lifestyle is even the next step beyond the passion, right? An MMA fighter, a mixed martial arts fighter who gets to the point where they're pro they're all they do is they diet because that's going to help their MMA. They watch MMA videos all day, every day. They train all day, every day. They're entering different fights. Their coat like 100% of their life gets consumed by mixed martial arts. So some ideas of lifestyle, parenting, uh, professionals, right? You meet a lot of people, what do you do? Um, and they'll reply with, I'm an architect, or I'm a lawyer, or I'm a blank, and they'll put their profession in there. Um, there's dietary options that people choose, uh, cyclists, pets, people are so amazingly crazy about their pets. Oftentimes, people will buy toys and, and healthy foods for their pets when they won't even do the same for themselves. CrossFit, triathletes, all of these things get people to a point where they literally get consumed by it and they rearrange all of the aspects of their life to prior, prioritize this one thing. And again, they're consuming lots of new products in that world. Then finally, we have the problem solution type niches when people really need to make a change. Now, oftentimes it requires the pain or the challenge to get big enough for them to really actually be willing to take action and make change. Um, weight loss, acne, diabetes, quitting smoking, PTSD, uh, this goes on and on and on. Our world is full. Everybody, everybody's got problems. Like in our world, literally everybody's got problems. And the way our world works today is Google is all of our kind of trusted confidant. Uh, most people will not ask their coworker about weight loss, acne, diabetes, or any of these things. Most people will not ask their family members. They're going to go to Google and they're going to ask their questions to Google, and they're going to find the most helpful people in that space. They're going to trust them. They're going to follow them. They're going to listen to their recommendations. And ultimately, you can become that person. And these people buy systems. They buy information. They buy tools. They buy actual equipment. They buy all kinds of things to help them achieve their goals. Now, many of these niches overlap, right? Passion and lifestyle, I kind of already talked about it. They're, they're often interchangeable. And sometimes you can combine a problem solution with a passion. You can actually help people within a passion with a specific problem and solution. Many of the top level niches are too competitive today, right? So weight loss is just too competitive. So you can look down below to find that underserved segment within the niche. That's where you're able to stand out. That's where you're really able to gain ground quickly, which is a big part of the goal here. So how do you go from the niche to the actual segment for your site concept? We want to reduce the amount of time it takes for you to stand out on the search engines, which is going to drive traffic so you can grow your list more quickly and ultimately make money. And this is where targeting a segment within a niche is key. So from photography, you could focus on portrait photography for parents. Parents are taking lots and lots of pictures of their children, and they want to take great pictures that make their kids look flattering, and currently they don't. So you could be the person who helps them do this, and you could talk about the different uses of different types of cameras. You can have a DSLR, right? A uh, like a fancy camera uh, side of your website, you can have an iPhone photography side of your business. Um, I've got a kind of a mutual acquaintance who teaches iPhone photography and he makes over a million dollars per year teaching people how to make pho great photographs with their iPhone. So this stuff works. There's the weight loss niche, and then you got to go deeper, right? The weight loss for new mothers over 30. This is a brilliant focused niche because the new mothers are going to have challenges. They're going to have time restraints. They got a baby, right? And when your content talks about how to lose weight, when you have a baby and you need to be ready for the, the blowouts and the challenges and the breakdowns and, and the, the constant feeding and the lack of sleep, you are speaking directly to that new mother. And when they feel 
feel that, when they feel that your weight loss content is speaking directly to them, their needs, their challenges, they're going to fall in love with you. They're going to ignore the big gurus in the weight loss space because they found somebody who is tailoring everything to them personally. So for golf, again, golf is too broad of a niche, but you can segment down to helping women hit better tee shots. So it's one aspect of the game. It's the tee shot and you're focused on helping women. You could add an age variant to that, right? It could be women over 50 hitting better tee shots, retired women hitting better tee shots. There's a lot of ways you can sub down and segment down for your site concept. And ultimately you can segment down too far. It too small of a segment and you're never going to get enough traffic. I kind of mentioned that before. So iPhone portrait photography for parents might actually be too small of a niche, but it could be a great category or segment or silo within the last one we talked about, which is just portrait photography for parents. Weight loss for new mothers of triplets over 40 is just too small and almost like a joke, right? Like I don't think you would actually go to triplets, but it's an example of how far is too far to niche down and ultimately how to hit your seven iron off the tee. That is too small of a niche because you really will need to, you know, that, that's maybe one or two times per round that someone uh, has that need and it would just be too small of an audience of people searching for that particular problem would make a great category, would make a great blog blog post could make a good silo on your site, which you'll learn all of the bits and pieces for that later. But ultimately you need to find that sweet spot in the niche. So let's talk about the process. That's what you're going to go through right now. The niche research process first step. And that's what we're going to do next is create a large list of possible niches that interest you. We need to create as big of a list as possible. I'm hoping you're writing page after page after page of ideas. Um, let it be messy. You can refine these down later. Uh, it takes thousands of hours again to build a successful niche site. So we need to find one that you like. I'm going to prompt you with lots of ideas, and then I'm going to show you resources where you can find even more ideas so you can really build out this master list. And then we're going to go to step two, which is eliminating the niches that don't meet basic general criteria. Um, we want to find passionate communities. We want to find products to promote and we want to find profitable competition. Competition is good. You want to see that other people are making money in the space because if no one else is making money in the space, odds are you're not going to be the only one to figure it out. So we do want to make sure that someone has, um, laid a path. They say that the second mouse gets the cheese. Uh, so we want to make sure that, that someone has proven the model works and then you can come in and outwork them and be more strategic. And that's what the forums and that's what everything else in this is all about to help you be more strategic than your competition. But we got to identify that right niche for you. And then finally, we're going to compare the supply and demand numbers on your final options. This is part two, right? So step three on this is actually part two of the training. And that's where we're going to let the search volume and profitability numbers really, truly guide you to to the best option that matches your personality, but has great numbers. Today, we're all in on the stuff that matches your personality, that excites you, etc. So creating your big list of niches is the next thing we're getting into. So if you haven't already, grab a pen and paper and start with brainstorming what interests you. I want you to just write down the things you've probably been thinking about the different niches, those little things that interest you, intrigue you, whether it's jewelry, jewelry or lapidary or silversmithing or photography or cell phone photography or gadgets, whatever, write down what you can think about. Just let yourself brainstorm. I want you to get some time moving the pen across the paper. Um, in the future, we're going to prompt you with questions, ideas, and resources. You're going to need to pause this training as needed to get those ideas out of your head. I'm going to move through these things quickly, but you need to take time letting this all soak in. And I'm going to be kind of throwing out ideas. I'm going to be sharing and vocalizing ideas that you maybe haven't thought of for a long time. My goal here is to say something like model trains. And you would think, oh man, I used to love model trains when I was a kid. I was all about it. I had all these, models. wow, I haven't thought about that for 15 years. Great, write that down. So we're going to go through this process of me prompting you with ideas, but don't think of these prompts I'm vocalizing as everything because I'm going to show you where to go to get even more promptings from a few different locations on the web that will give you access to hundreds, if not thousands of potential ideas. You're looking for things that have interested you in the past, things you've spent time with in the past, things that you've known other people to be really passionate and excited about. And you maybe never got into it, but you know, like those folks are super passionate. And I got some friends who are into that. That could be interesting. All of these ideas that kind of 
resonate with you as, huh, okay, that sounds kind of interesting, write them down. The goal is to make as big of a list as possible for this next phase. The questions I want you to answer first are, if you were getting on an airplane and you had to choose a magazine to read or browse for a couple of hours, you got a quick flight, you're standing at the magazine newsstand, they're in every airport in the world, and you're like, ah, I'm just gonna flip through a magazine on this flight, what magazine would you get? If you need some promptings on magazines, pause the video and go to magazines.com. Would it be a handgun magazine? Would it be hunting? Would it be camping? Would it be a National Geographic? Would it be about sewing or about knitting? Would it be about cars, road and track, right? What magazine would you enjoy reading the ads, reading the copy, looking at the pictures, just kind of flipping through? Would it be the, the Home and Garden, the Sunset Magazine, the, the Outdoor Adventure Magazine? What magazines would you like to read if you had an hour or two just to flip through? Then the next idea is what seemingly random topics really light your fire? What gets you excited in this world, right? Everything, there's something in this world that excites everyone. And you're probably at some point going to think, you know, how to make money online really excites me. That's, oh man, that, that really excites me. Feel free to write that down. And you're going to see when we get to the data side, to the numbers, how incredibly difficult it would be for someone new to actually break out in that space. The, the analogy I like to use is uh, I'm, I'm going to help you climb a mountain of sorts here. Um, you obviously have the option to choose to go climb Everest as your first mountain ever. Um, but remember, professional climbers die on Everest every single year. Literally, the trail to the top of Everest is littered with dead bodies from people who have trained for years and something happened and they did not make it. So I highly recommend you don't go after that mountain first. Let's get you climbing a couple of hills in your neighborhood, maybe the highest peak in your state. Um, if you're in California and you have the highest uh, peak in, in the lower 48. Maybe we won't even go for the highest peak, right? Maybe we'll just get you to hike up to the top of the Tahoe Rim Trail from the bottom, right? We want to get you in a mountain that's big enough that's going to really flex all of the muscles and it's going to challenge you, but I don't want you to get to the point where you're going to pour in three to five years of work and still get no results. That is the dying on Everest challenge. And again, if you want to put those ideas down, I, you know, internet marketing, digital marketing, uh, interest, Instagram marketing, if those really do excite you uh, and really light your fire, feel free to write them down, but complete the other aspects of this too. And let's let the data guide us because the data will help you find those niches that are underserved. They have great search volume that you could stand out in quick and start making money with quick. And that's a key. Then the next one I want you to write down and you should be pausing this to take time to write these ideas down as they come to you. What are you already good at? What games have you been playing for a while? What games, board games, video games, computer games, right? Like what types of games do you enjoy? Arts, are you into any arts? Are you good with charcoal, pen and paper, pencil, right? It could be uh, arts and crafts. It could be scrapbooking. It doesn't really matter, but what kind of arts? That leads us to the crafts as well. What have you been doing professionally for five years, for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years? If you've been doing something professionally for 10 to 20 years, if you're in your 50s and you've had a career and you're just tired of it, oftentimes the fastest way for you to replace your day job with your own income to where you own your time, you regain that ownership of your time, it's to go do more of what you've been doing professionally, but let's just change how you're doing it so you can reach a broader audience, so you can get leverage on your side and get you to stop trading dollars for hours and start actually building systems that could create sales while you sleep. That's where we can go. So write down anything you've been doing professionally, whether that's current or even past professional. Uh, interpersonally, what are you good at? Are you good at talking to um, the other gender, right? Are you a guy who's really good at talking to girls or vice versa? Are you a girl who's really good at talking to guys? Are you a matchmaker? Are you able to really understand people's challenges and problems easily? Are you just kind of a natural born coach? What are those interpersonal things that you're good at or that are fun? And then physically what are you good at physically um this could be anything from from hacky sack and foot bag to to juggling all the way to power lifting or um crossfit flipping over gigantic tires or all those crazy things they do in the crossfit world um physically what are those things you're good at gymnastics flexibility stretching trampoline i mean anything that you do physically that just lights you up that's fun that that's exciting uh slack lining uh rock climbing all of these different physical activities mountain biking what what do you enjoy doing in that world then the next one, 
what topic do you know a lot about that most people don't understand? We've all got access to these little things that we know about that everybody else in the world's like, what? Like, that's even a thing? Like, oh, that's so random. But with the internet, these tribes of, I'll call them weirdos, because I'm a weirdo, we're all weirdos, right? These tribes connect online. That's actually where they connect with each other. So maybe it's the Magic and the Gathering type games. Maybe you you just love old retro video game consoles. Maybe you build entire stand-up video game cabinet, like gaming cabinets, um, and, and nobody else gets it, but you just really enjoy doing that. These are often great ways for you to identify these unique and seemingly random sub niches that in your local sphere, right? Your, your coworkers, your, your family, your local friends, the people you see in, in day-to-day -day interactions, they wouldn't really get it. But when you go online and when you get into an online community, there is a raving community of people who love this 3d printing, gunsmithing, reloading ammunition for, you know, reloading shotgun shells for skeet shooting. Who knows what that actually is for you, but what are those topics that you know a lot about that most people don't understand or don't even care about write them down is your list growing at this point are you doing the action because we can't get you to the point of finding your niche and ultimately growing your niche audience and growing your business and growing your list and making money if you don't do the work so I need you to be doing the work right now. I need you to be actually writing down these ideas. If you haven't started, pause, go get a pen and paper, but I trust that you are, so we're gonna move forward here. More questions for you to write your answers to. What problem in your life do you need to solve in the next three to five years, right? This is going towards the idea of document, don't create. And again, if you think, well, making money online is that thing I have to figure out, go ahead and write it down. And we will see what the data says in the future, because ultimately I can tell you right now that the, the competition is just too fierce to make that uh, a very logical, reasonable uh, first approach for most niche marketers. Um, but we want to get these other ideas. What problems in your life? Have you been diagnosed with something? Do you have um, stomach issues that you just got to figure out? Are you overweight and you realize that you're approaching an age and your weight is at a point that it's getting harder and harder to lose weight every single day and you have to change are you trying to get competitive in a sport are you are you trying to become a a competitive uh, steeplechase horseback that's where they they race the horses over the courses that that jump over the the different pylons and stuff right are you working with a, a new dog and you're gonna help your new dog get into the dog racing and those different types of dog racing where they run through the obstacles and stuff like and that is that the three to five year challenge um do you have a newborn in your life and you're gonna have to learn how to live life with a newborn over the next three to five years what are the problems in your life that you're facing that you're gonna need to solve in the next three to five years have you been making really good money and not doing anything with your investments and you need to figure out what you're going to do with your money. Are you looking to become a real estate investor and you're brand new and you're trying to figure out how to dominate at the game of becoming a landlord in your local market? These are the things that you need to write down. Next, what do you see as meaningful that is often underrated or overlooked by others? Now, this is really getting into your heart center, right? Like, what are those things that you care about that you think the world needs more of? These are the ideas that are like biodiesel or plug-in electric hybrid cars or um, electric bikes or riding your bike to work or um, zero waste lifestyle, right? Like these ideas of, of bring your bags and, and, and eliminating plastic from, from your world or what are those little things inside of you that you're just so passionate about? It could be, it could be have a political slant, right? Maybe you're just so passionate about libertarian or you're, you're so passionate about universal basic, like any of these ideas that really light you up that others, whether they, they, it could be a polarizing idea and that's often a really good thing, or it could be something that most people ignore or don't even think about, but you see it as actually really, really important in life and other people ignore it. Um, you know, for my wife and I, nine years ago, when we started, um, our main niche site that we're running today together, um, meditation was one of those things for us. Like most people overlooked it. They, they didn't value it. It wasn't nearly as trendy then as it is today. Um, yoga was just starting to become kind of trendy at that point in time. And really, for us, it was something we saw as vitally important to our health, our well-being, and ultimately to our business. Um, because when we took time to recharge, and that, that's how we found ours, right? It was that thing to us that most people overlooked that really had a big impact on our life. And we decided we wanted to share that with the world. Next prompting question. What will many people need more of in the next few years? So there's a couple of ways of thinking about this idea, right? I want to repeat that. 
what will many people need more of in the next few years? So you can look at population segments. We have the millennial population segment who are, you know, they're getting out of college. They have a lot of student loan debt on average. They're kind of getting into the world of professional, the, the professional world a little bit. They're probably going to want to buy houses in the next few years. They're probably going to want to qualify for mortgages in the next few years. They're probably going to want to maybe start their own business. Maybe they're going to want to get on a career path in the next few years, right? What are those things? They might want to have children and start a family in the next few years. Then you look at the baby boomers, right? They're, they're retiring at a massive rate of speed. Tens of thousands per day are retiring. So you have this population of people who have money. They've spent the last 30 to 40 years of their life working, right? Commuting to a building that they didn't necessarily want to be at and being around people. Now they go home and their kids are gone and they're kind of empty nested. And they're like, what do I do with myself, right? What are the challenges that these individuals are faced? You could talk about weight loss and, and staying healthy, um, activities, fun activities, hobbies, uh, not getting bored and depressed because they're now not feeling useful anymore at their day job. They're now at a, an empty house. Um, they might do more gardening moving forward. They might have health issues that they're going to have to take care of moving forward, right? So what are the ideas that you have that many people are going to need more of in the next few years based on demographics? Then there's, you know, where do you see the world going type ideas? Um, Obviously, in the last 10 years, we have seen the proliferation of screen time. Everyone is spending more time focused scrolling through screens than ever before. And that has all the signs of continuing to speed up. And it might go to the point of augmented reality and virtual reality. You know, uh, the Pokemon Go video game was one of, or app, I guess a game app. Um, that was one of the first real augmented reality experiments in our world. And it was a massive, massive success. So this is kind of the futurist idea of what technologies and what things are going to be coming out into the world more. Um, and if you're interested in those segments, that's another way to look at this question of what will many people need more of in the next few years. Um, that's one of those interesting questions. Um, home delivery of groceries might be something like that. Um, it's There's a lot of different interesting ways to go. There's a new book by Kevin Kelly. Um, I don't remember the name. It starts with an I. It's got a lot of arrows on the cover. I'll, I'll make sure I'll, I'll link to that below. Um, Kevin Kelly in, he wrote uh, KK.org. Anyways, KK.org, you can find his newest book. It's all about this futurism and about what's coming down the pipeline. So if you're interested in this stuff, definitely check out Kevin Kelly's new book. KK.org is his website. Um, and then what is one habit that people need to implement to live a better life? So again, this is back kind of one that, that caught my wife and my attention. We really do believe that the habit of daily meditation really helps people live a much better life. Um, diet, right? Like eating less processed foods, eating more leafy greens is one habit that people need to implement. And when you're looking at this, what are the ones that are you're just super passionate about? It could be chia seed green smoothies, right? It could be exercising every day. It could be cycling, right? You could see that as the solution um, that people need to implement to live a better life. So we're going to kind of keep going down here. And the next thing I want you to look at is a little mental exercise back through what are your recent big purchases? And when I say recent, I'm talking like, you know, one to three years. What have you spent a hundred, 300, 500, a thousand dollars or more on in the last several years? Have you bought a fancy pants vacuum cleaner for your house? Um, do you continue to buy fancy kitchen equipment? Are you a kitchen gadget freak? And you're just like, I need that new food processor and I need the juicer and I need the, the, the Excalibur dehydrator. Like, is that your game? Cool. Write down these big purchases and then see if a little pattern forms to where it's like, ah, kitchen gadgets. Like, wow, I do spend a lot of money on kitchen gadgets because when you build an authority site the right way, you're actually able to deduct from your income, the expenses of purchasing the products that you review, that you're kind of using, that you're recommending. Now it often, you know, not often, it requires you to make money in order to have a deduction, right? If you're deducting from a loss, that just creates more of a loss. Um, so at some point you need to be earning income, but if you have a day job and you're already spending a lot of time and energy in the world of cycling, um, there is a way to get this to work really beneficially for you to where as you're buying new wheels, new tires, new tubes, new pedals, new bits and pieces for your bikes, you're doing reviews on them. That actually can be a um, business deduction for you. Uh, you do need to turn a profit at some 
some point with your business, um, talk to a CPA to, to get all the, the bits and pieces of that. But that's why we're looking through your recent purchases because it's what are you already spending money on? What are you already kind of doing regularly in your life that could become a little side business for you? So gym memberships, have you bought a weight bench? Have you bought a treadmill? What about an elliptical machine, a DSLR body? What about a 50 millimeter lens to make excellent portraits or an ultra zoom lens, right? Have you bought a new guitar, an acoustic guitar, a bass guitar? What type of a guitar? Have you bought a tennis racket, a table saw? Have you done any training or personal coaching? Have you bought a road bike or maybe a drafting table or maybe an easel for painting, right? Have you bought crystal singing bowls? What about a fly fishing rod? Maybe some new golf clubs, a sewing machine, a blend tech blender, ultralight backpack, right? Have you gone down the path of an ultralight tent and then an ultralight backpack? I mean, that's another little segment of the outdoors world where once they go down that slippery slope, everything needs to become titanium and ultralight. It gets really expensive and they look for the best ones on Google. Um, so this is this is one of those, those ideas to look back through your recent purchases of big purchases and big items to try to identify those things that you're already buying. Because oftentimes we can look at our behavior, we might not be able to think of it. But when we look at our behavior and what we're actually spending our money on the pattern might appear from there. So pause the video, take a moment for yourself and really dig in and think about what you've spent money on in the last few years, specifically hundreds of dollars on, or you just keep buying it over and over and over. You buy more and more and more of them. It could be a type of makeup. It could be different makeups. Maybe that's the, the sec segment of the, the beauty area that you're just, you're so passionate about. That's what you buy. You love doing your makeup hauls. Perfect. That could be it for you. So take some time, press pause and write down some big purchases. Next up, we go to Amazon. Now, most people think Amazon is an e-commerce website. Although you can purchase things on Amazon, Amazon is actually a search engine. And it's the one search engine in the world that when just about everyone goes to it, they've got their credit card in hand and they're ready to buy something. So that's what's really powerful about Amazon. Now, I'm gonna run through some of these categories. Again, my goal is to mention something and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that's cool, right? Boom, write it down. When you hear something that resonates, that your body lights up, that you perk up a little bit, your ears perk up, that's what you wanna write down. So do you care about the beauty realm, the health realm, housewares? What about smart home stuff? Are you into smart home gadgetry, electronics, toys? Kids stuff. Do you buy lots of kids clothes and kids toys? What about video games? Are you into new video games? Are you into old video games? Are you a Fortnite fan? Are you are you a, a retro um, Atari or Genesis fan? What about team sports and individual sports? And this doesn't have to be for you. It could be for your kids. Do you have kids who are entering a world of team sports? Are you coaching these team sports? What about outdoors? We already talked about backpacking and hiking and what other outdoor activities do you enjoy doing? Weight loss products, tools. DIY, are you a DIY person? Do you do a bunch of repairs around the house? What about the automotive world? Kitchen appliances? What about natural products? Do you, do you like green products like bamboo socks and bamboo clothing or sustainable products? Board games, do you buy board games? Do you like interested in board games? What about card games? What about fashion items? What about jewelry? It could be costume jewelry, it could be real jewelry, it could be gemstone jewelry, it could be silver jewelry. What about shoes, clothing, handbags? about new and exciting gadgets, right? Do you, are you always interested in what that new stuff is? And you just, you want to know what new products are coming out on market and you, you love reading opinion pieces about them and just, just really experiencing them. Gardening. Do you like gardening? Like, would you love to have a greenhouse at home? Do you already have a greenhouse at home? Do you love flower gardening? Do you love creating a garden for butterflies or maybe a fruit or, or a vegetable garden? Or do you love your fruit trees? What about pets, right? People buy a lot and a lot, a lot of things for their pets. Pets are incredibly expensive long-term because people spend a lot of money on their pets. Photography, another one. Do you, do you love taking pictures? What about videography? Are you an amateur cinematographer? Do you love vlogging? What about art? Are you really into art? Is there a certain type of art that you're really into? Now, I want you to go to Amazon after just hearing those, and I want you to look for more. So simply go to amazon.com and then up top, right where that red arrow is, there's a button that says departments. Okay, super quick update for you because Amazon moved the link that gets you over to this main directory. So it's not on the top navigation anymore. You just click the three lines on the top left. That's called a hamburger menu. It pops out the pop out window and scroll down just above the help link and you'll see full store directory. Just click on that and it'll load the directory so you can follow the next steps from here. If you're enjoying the video, give me a thumbs up here on YouTube and enjoy the rest of the show. 
Now it pulls up these different departments that you're seeing. You can scroll down for hundreds of niche ideas. And actually you'll notice like on the right, it says automotive and industrial. And then it's got all of these little sub niches, right? And that's where you really want to focus is on all of those little sub niche items. So take a read through there and really see and look around for ones that you're like, oh, that's interesting. Or, oh man, when I was younger, I cared about that. Or I got a friend who really, really likes that. I never, never dabbled in that, but boy, I know a few people who are really interested in that. So pause the video, go to amazon.com, click on departments, and then go through and pull out any ones on your master list. Your list should be getting big. You should be turning pages. Your, your legal pad or your notepad should be getting full. And that is a very good thing. We want to exercise the process of breaking down that thought of, I can't think of anything and proving to ourselves that we have hundreds of ideas around. And then we're going to go through and filter them down and filter them down and filter them down to find your perfect niche. So jump over to Amazon now and then come back and hit play again when you're ready to go on to the next step. Okay. Indoor hobby ideas. Now we're going to go into a whole series of different hobby ideas. And I'm going to break them up based on indoor and outdoor and, and, and individual and team based, et cetera, and collecting. So there are more, I'm going to show you where to find more, but I'm just going to say these again, because I'm trying to trigger. I want you to use your auditory experience to tell you when, ah, Oh, that sounds kind of cool. So indoor hobby ideas, gunsmithing, candle making, 3d printing, photography, sewing, soap making, leather crafting. And again, like when I say sewing, right? Like what about needlepoint? What about um, crochet? What about knitting, right? Knife making, coffee roasting, lapidary. What about silversmithing or goldsmithing or gemstone faceting? You see under each and every one of these, there's often dozens of segments that are available. Knitting, I already mentioned, woodworking. What about cosplay? Do you love dressing up and goofing off and doing cosplay? Like, would you dream about going to the San Diego uh, Comic Con every year or whatever Comic Cons there are in the world? Would that be like a dream come true for you to be able to go to that every single year and fully deck yourself out and really immerse yourself in that? Write it down. What about table tennis? What about real tennis, right? Like any of these ideas are very possible. And I wonder if table tennis is actually an indoor hobby. Um, I play table tennis very crazily, so maybe I'm an outdoor guy. So there's the outdoor hobby ideas next. What about air sports like airsoft, fishing, snowboarding, sailing, paintball, martial arts, metal detecting, prospecting for gems and, and rock hounding, whitewater kayaking. What about flatwater kayaking? Polo. What about steeplechase? What about dressage? What about horseback riding? Mountain biking bushcraft, right? Bushcraft is, um, you know, kind of tags on to, to camping, but a little bit more about sustainability. Is that interesting or, or self-sustaining um, kind of survivalism? What about horseback riding, kite flying, backpacking, rock climbing, obviously like drone flying, right? Drones could be in on this collection based hobby ideas. People who have collections are so passionate about getting that next one and finding that, that one that fills their collection up. Antiques, what about cards? Could be baseball cards, could be Magic of the Gathering cards, right? There's all kinds of different types of cards. Coins, numismatics, right? Is that interesting to you? Comic books, die cast cars, die cast models, vintage Hot Wheels, old school Barbies, right? From the 70s and the 60s. What about like retro toys from the 80s, the, the toys from when you were a kid type thing? Or retro video games, right? The old Nintendo consoles and stuff. A lot of people who have those left in the attic when their kids left, uh, mom might just want to dump them and not know what the value is. Or mom might go to Google and search for it and try to figure out what the value is of those things. And maybe you could become a hub and a source of information to help people identify which is good, which isn't. Stamps, model trains, fossils, gems, minerals, about flower pressing or uh, insects. You ever see those like dried kind of insects that are in those little things? I'm not, not a huge fan of those things. I buy them for family members for gifts because I think it's funny because nobody likes them. But um, here's a giant beetle for, for Christmas, cousin. Ha <laughs> ha. Anyways, um, what about competitive hobby ideas, right? Are you, do you love competition? Are you, are you a competitive person? Darts, foosball, right? Table soccer, uh, knife throwing, hatchet throwing, archery, slot car racing, uh, first person shooter games, esports. Oh my gosh, esports is a massive, massive, massive industry at this point in time. Not only the prize money for the best esports players in the world, but but just the whole world of Twitch and people watching other people play games is incredible. What about fencing? 
chess. I know a friend who runs a chess education website and they do extremely well. It's actually two guys I know. Um, they've been able to afford the lifestyle they want to live for many years. I think one guy bought a condo down in Mexico and literally 100% sustained off of selling information on chess. And if you think about it, Chess is such an old game. There's so many great books from so many of the masters, and yet these guys who, they're not even that great at chess. They just chose it. They've been working their booties off for 10 years on it, and they've really, they've actually partnered with a bunch of different course creators in chess, and they've created kind of a, a library or a platform for great chess content, and they're doing extremely well. So that's a, that's a crowded marketplace that they've still been able to find uh, themselves niching down. What about bowling? Uh, I bowled a ton as a kid. Um, and if I was near a set of lanes and I was kind of more stable, uh, man, there's a really good chance I would start a bowling niche site um, because I'm, I'm pretty good at it already. And, and with a bit of focused effort and um, documentation, I, I could get really, really good really quick. And it would be a fun process for me. Um, just don't have any bowling alleys around where I'm at. Uh, so I just play internet games. Um, what about go-kart racing? Is that something your kids are into? Is that something you're into? What about just building go-karts, right? Building them from scratch, from the frames and the old uh, vertical lawnmower engines, etc. What about lacrosse? First person view racing drones. Rowing. RC car racing. RC planes, right? Cricket. Poker. Weightlifting. Air pistols. Skeet shooting. Dog sports. Steeplechase. Another horse racing idea, right? What about observational hobby ideas? Astronomy, right? Amateur astronomy, geocaching, whale watching, birds watching. I didn't even spell that right, and that's okay. Fish keeping, photography, meteorology, astrology. What about just reading books? Like, do you just love reading? Meditation. What about learning? Do you love learning? Do you love the art of learning? Are you just fascinated with how we can keep filling our brains with more and more information and it's never full and you can keep adding more and like, where does it all go? Like, are you just, is that something you're really interested in? What about cinema, right? Do you love movies? Do you have old movies? Do you love new movies? Do you have old horror flicks, old B movies from the seventies? I want you to research even more hobby ideas. So go to Google and search for Wikipedia's list of hobbies. And you're gonna see this page. It's, it'll come up as the top. It's, it's literally Wikipedia's list of hobbies. Now on the left, you'll see that they have all of the different hobby types. I just broke out a few of them for you here. But if you scroll down, all that left navigation does is actually bring you to lower portions in this page. So it's all on this page. It's a very long page. And there are a ton of hobby ideas. Read through them. Which ones were you enjoyed when you were a kid? Which ones were you interested in as a teen, but you never got around to it, or you never had the time, or your, your family couldn't afford it, or you lived too far away from the thing needed, right? Like, what, what are those areas in life that you would enjoy? That's the key at this point. We want to find those things that overlap with what you enjoy, what you'd, be, what you'd have fun learning about, talking about, researching about, making videos about, making blog posts about, making podcast episodes about. That's the real key. So at this point, I would like you to pause the video and go Google Wikipedia's list of hobbies, then go to the list of hobbies and take some time reading through and grow your list so we can get that master list as big as we possibly can. Next up, I want you to look into your personal, your professional, and your life experiences. Now, when we teach from experience, I've found the process gets easier. You are always able to go research a topic, come up with an outline, and create a new piece of content on something you don't know a ton about. It is possible, but that takes a long time. For me to create my YouTube videos that I put out, I generally come up with an idea, like ah, I'm going to talk about this today. I turn on the camera, and I go because I've got 15 plus years experience making money online. I've been full time as a digital marketer, internet marketer since 2010. So that's over eight years of experience actually doing this day in, day out, 60 hour, 80 hour weeks, pretty much going full on for eight, 10 years plus. That's what I'm bringing to the table. So what comes easy to you? And that's one of the ways to look back into your past, your personal, your professional, and your life experience. What comes easy to you that others compliment you on? This could be playing a game, right? You could be tied into the world of online gaming and you could just master this game and everybody's like, damn, you are like, they want to be on your team when, when the, the teams are chosen, right? What are these things you're really, really good at? What have you been doing for five or more years professionally? 
Now, remember, we live in a day and age when every niche has an audience. This doesn't have to be a super exciting or high value thing to you. It could be you've been a florist for five years working at the local grocery store in their florist department. That is a huge opportunity. Um, and then it could be what have you been doing, you know, non-professionally for five plus years, gardening, um, a specific type of gardening, flower gardening on your balcony, etc. cetera. Um, what aspects of your life feel normal to you that others comment on in envy? right? Like that could be the garden thing, right? If your garden, if your yard on your house just is thriving and the butterflies and the bees, and it is just a, a booming metropolis of life in your garden and all your neighbors around just can't keep it together and their yards look like rubbish and they just can't grow their plants. And it just like, it's just normal to you, right? That's what you're looking for. It's really difficult for us to actually see um, what our talents are in this world because there are talents. They feel easy to us, but to others, they seem like magic. That is something that you need to try to identify. And it can be a little challenging and looking at how other people react to the things that you do that come naturally to you. That's a key. Um, so write these down. If any, if these spark any ideas, be sure to write it down. Then what challenges have you overcome that others struggle with? Have you lost 50 pounds at some point in your life? Have you overcome something that was debilitating at some point in your life? Have you learned how to manage a diagnosis or a challenge, right? Naturally, without needing to use the, the pharmaceutical path, right? Have you learned how to manage diabetes naturally through diet and exercise in a way that you don't have to run your blood sugar level every day anymore and that, that you've literally, there's no insulin required anymore when at one point there was insulin, right? There's a lot of people who are growing older, who are experiencing more challenges in their lives. And there's a lot of skepticism around the traditional pharmaceutical way of doing things. Um, if this doesn't definitely doesn't have to be a um, physical ailment type thing, but it could be. So think back in your life, what challenges have you overcome that others struggle with? Um, are you a, a woman who in the in the business world, you were able to get promoted up to manager and now you're in the C-suite, right? You're a, you're the chief technical officer um, in, a, in a space just dominated by men, but you found the way to advance quickly as a woman in the workplace. Great, that is a challenge that you have overcome that others will absolutely be struggling with and you could help this audience overcome that. And maybe it just came natural to you. That's just how you roll. But to a lot of women, it doesn't, right? And that's the kind of thing you wanna identify. Um, and it can be difficult to see. So, so take some time for introspection on this. Really, really think on this. Feel free to pause the video and really kind of get deep on this with yourself. Because now, at this point, we're gonna start pruning the list. So at this point, you hopefully have a giant, messy uh, notepad full of different pages of ideas. Um, and we're going to go through these in several different ways. There's, there's three specific processes that you're going to learn here today in this video in order to prune the list. But at this point, before we go forward, you should have everything that you need to be able to go through. We're about, how long are we into this? About 45 minutes in or so into the video. So if you need to pause it and you wanna, you wanna go back through this part again, great, start over, go through it again. See if you can get more ideas. The more ideas you have down right now, the more research you do on this niche stuff is how you outwork your competitors, right? Not always, the work is not always just write the blog post, grow the email list, write the blog post, write the blog post. Sometimes it's out researching them and it's finding these underserved audiences and everybody sticks with one of the big threes and they, you know, weight loss for women, that's it, right? But you taking time to be more creative, to think a little bit deeper and to really go deeper on this, that's how you stand out. That's how you find these segments that are underserved and how you can absolutely explode on the scene because when you're one of five people creating content on a specific topic that gets searched a lot, you're gonna hit the first page of Google pretty quick because there's only five other people. But if you walk into the space where there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people creating content on how to make money online, and you're gonna try to step into the how to make money online space, you have hundreds of millions of people who you potentially have to outrank versus five. And I'm just trying to help you understand making it easy on yourself by going after the kind of underserved audiences that aren't currently dominated by big, big money, big business. Um, it's a really easy way to align yourself quickly with the result you desire, which is a growing business. So I'm gonna give you one more chance to pause it here. Uh, feel free to take a note of the timestamp. If you want to go do a walk, whatever you need to do, come back and let's go through the prune your niche here next.
Okay, let's jump into it here. So we're going to do three types of research here. We're going to do community research, competitor research, and product research. And you're going to have to pause this video in order to complete the research for the different niche ideas. Before you get started, I recommend taking a moment to read through your niche. And if it's completely messy, you might want to transfer this into a new format. At this point, you could use an Excel spreadsheet and you could just put each niche idea in one in the first row, right? So, so just column a becomes the niche idea after niche idea after niche idea. And then you could build on it from there, or you may just want to rewrite it out on a notepad. So it's a little bit cleaner, or you might just be like, miles, stop talking. Let's go. I'm ready for it. And that's where we're headed to next. But, um, if you want to rework this and make it a little bit cleaner, we're going to be taking notes. We're going to be, we're going to be building on what you've already done. So, um, analyze your approach from here as you see bit as you see fit. So the first thing is community research. We want to find if there is a sub Reddit on the topic. If you're not familiar with Reddit, it is the largest forum on the internet and Reddit is full of sub Reddits. And it's a place where people who are excited about similar topics gather to talk banter and, and yell at each other sometimes randomly. Um, but it, it's a place where people about subtopics join together to talk about what they're interested in. And you can often find that there are subreddits about the most random things in the world, like the subreddit of birds with arms, where people Photoshop big beefy arms and little skinny arms on pictures of birds. I don't know why it's hilarious. I enjoy browsing it from time to time, but there are so many obscure niches on Reddit that that's the first thing is go, go look. So redditlist.com gives you a list of the top 5,000 subreddits. I would just go plug in each niche idea into redditlist.com. Does it come up with a subreddit within the actual top 5,000? Is it one of the top 5,000 Reddit sub niches? If so, that's a very good sign because Reddit is a community driven website. There's no corporation creating these subreddits. These are individuals who are passionate about a topic. They rarely make money on the topic. They're just passionate about it. So they build these forums and they manage them and they have to moderate them and they have to create rules. And there, there's actually a lot of work. So when someone is putting that kind of work in for something for free, that's a good sign that there's a commercial potential for it as well. Then on Reddit, if you just Google list of subreddits, you'll find this list of subreddits wiki, right? There's the link there. Um, I will be adding these, this PDF so you can flip through to this slide. Um, this is slide number 25 right here. But um, I think if you just searched on Google for a list of subreddits, you can find that link. And there, there's the other one. You can literally use control F on that page, which is find it's find on page. And that's how you can find those different niche ideas on that page to see what's going on there. Now, if they're in the top 5,000, you can pretty much guess that they're relatively active because that's part of the ranking, but you might want to click into the different subreddits when you find them and just take a look. How many users, how active are they? Like look at the recency of posts on the subreddit and how many users are there 30 users in it, right? Are there 300,000 users? And when there's a larger audience on a subreddit, that generally means there's a bigger audience in the world. This is kind of a random slice of what's going on in the world. I do think Reddit, um, their demographics skews a little bit younger, but, um, I think it's a really good understanding of whether there is a community viability. And if you don't find a subreddit, or if you only find dead subreddits, then you want to eliminate it, cross it off of your list. This is the first way that we're pruning things off of your list here. Um, so eliminate the niche ideas that have no subreddits. So, it, you know, in the world that my, my wife and I live in, we would look for things uh, such as obviously meditation, but really going deeper to like angel cards and channelings. Um, those are kind of those core sub niches within our main niche where we really stand out and, and there are actually some very active uh, subreddits in, in that space there. So doing Reddit based community research first. And remember the, the, the exact word that you wrote down as the niche idea might not be it. So you might need to search for two or three things to find the actual subreddit, but um, everything from woodworking photography, you'll find that there's often dozens of subreddits about that topic. There's probably a portrait photography. There's probably a night sky photography. There's probably a nature and landscape photography. There's all kinds of different subreddits around photography. So you're not just looking for the one you want to kind of just survey the landscape to see how many different 
kind of niche subreddits and groups are there and then how active are there is what you're doing with the goal of eliminating the ideas that have no subreddits or dead subreddits or very low numbers. How do you know it's very low? Well, you're going to go through this process probably dozens, if not a hundred or so times here, uh, when you press pause, because you have that many niches on your list and you'll just be able to compare them. If everything else is in the tens of thousands of, um, Redditors subscribed, and then you find a few that have like a hundred and 300 and 500, those are the low ones. And the tens of thousands is kind of your norm. So it's, it's really a factor of what you've taken down here. Once you've done the Reddit research, which you should have paused it, and then done the research, you want to go look for niche forums because not everybody gets on Reddit, right? That's uh, understandable. There is a specific demographic that, that uses that site, even though it is one of the most popular websites in the world. So just go Google niche comma forums. So woodworking comma forums on Google and see what kind of different forums are there and how many are there and then open them up. Are there new daily conversations inside of these forums? You can usually see on a forum list on the right side, it'll say, you know, when the most recent post was, and it's okay if a few of those sub forums and threads aren't updated every day, but you want to see a lot of activity within the last day, within the last week, and then click in a few, read around, look around. Is this a real forum, right? If there's several different thriving forums on a specific topic, that's a very, very good sign. Um, and then you can also look for, top 10 and then whatever that niche is forums you should join. So don't Google that when you're looking at niche comma forums. So if you did like road cycling comma forums, and then on that first page, it says top 10 road cycling forums, you should join. That's a good sign. That means not only are there so many forums out there that a content creator actually felt it worthy or necessary to go create a list of the best ones to join, which means there's actually a plethora of them where someone was like, I need to actually kind of make sure people know which are the good ones. So that's a really good thing to search for. Go do that. Press pause, do the work. This is what successful people do. They take time to do the work. It's a pain in the neck. I know I'm, I'm actually forcing you to do the work. You can't just watch and listen and, and get the value out of it and have some aha moment. We need to actually do the work here. So I'm, I really encourage you pause it, go in, spend time, look through the reddits, look through the niche forums. Your goal is to eliminate the ones that are dead, eliminate the ones that don't have any niche forums. If no one's put together a niche forum on this idea over the years and it hasn't gained any traction or there's one and it's dead, like the biodiesel forums, right? If you search for biodiesel forums, there's one, it's an info pop forum that was thriving in 2007, 2008, 2009, and then it's completely dead. And there's barely any new posts on this forum. Uh, that would get crossed off the list because the community is not strong anymore. So eliminate the ones that don't have strong communities. Feel free to circle and highlight, uh, put little asterisks and stars next to the ones that you think look really, really good here. Then we're going into Facebook and Facebook. We want to look at the groups. So what I've showed you here on this screenshot is you simply type the niche in the actual search bar. And when you search, it brings you all. And then I've got the second red arrow on the right side below my mug shot. Um, click on the groups and now it will show you only the groups and it'll tell you right on this list. If there are 10 posts a day, plus that's the biggest number as of this recording, they might change that, but you'll see, it might say two posts a day. It might say one post a day, but if you see multiple groups with 10 posts, 10 plus posts per day, that's a really, really good sign. Click on these. You're also looking at the member numbers, right? So right here we can see 5,800, 33,000, 26,000. These are really big groups and they're really active groups. So click on them, look through. Is there a lot of banter? Is there a lot of conversation? Are not only the posts being posted going live, but are there a lot of conversation? Are there a lot of comments on the posts, right? You want to see the engagement and interaction. You don't need to build a Facebook group. You don't need to leverage Facebook marketing. We want to know and make sure someone has. They've proved the model. Remember, you're the second mouse. You're looking for that first mouse who's got some cheese, right? They or they went for the cheese. They hit the trap, and you're gonna go get the cheese because yeah, that's a bad analogy. It gets a little weird. But anyways, look through the Facebook groups and make sure that they have active Facebook groups. There's several active Facebook groups. They have large numbers. I mean, thousands and tens of thousands of users, and there are lots of them having 10 plus posts per day. Pause the video go to facebook.com, do the research. And again, the goal is to find the ones that don't. 
You can highlight the ones that have a lot, but the goal is to cross out. You want to be pruning your list at this point. You want to be removing the ones that clearly don't have many groups. And I'm going to show you some more hacks in Facebook here soon, but that's the goal. So at this point, I really need to make sure that you've gone through the process of eliminating the niches that are clearly dead or dying. Competition is a good thing. Competition proves that there's money in the niche. If I would have resisted creating content on how to do internet marketing because there was competition, where would that have put me, right? My wife, when we first started her main niche site in 2009, um, there was a lady who uh, backed by a major, major, major publishing company. She had written 65 books and created 65 books and angel card decks. By the time uh, my wife even started her website, uh, this lady published her first book when my wife was two. There was some heavy, heavy, heavy hitters in the space. And we still were able to make a name for ourselves that actually just proved that there was some money in the space. It actually proved that it was possible to talk about the ideas that we still talk about to this day and it had some commercial viability. So competition is a good thing. And now you wanna add, if you haven't transferred over to a spreadsheet or a Word doc, you, you probably, probably now is a good time to do that. But if you've been in a Word doc and a spreadsheet, you've just been eliminating them and you've just been thinning it out. Um, you can add additional notes in the next research steps, which is key. That's what we're gonna get to next. Um, I really need you to, to complete this phase of research. Um, there's just a couple of more little phases that we're gonna go through and then, then you're done. But um, every hour, every minute, every, page and research moment that you give is actually going to serve you for years and years and years to come. This is something you can get through in a, in a weekend, in a day, in an afternoon. It takes a lot of work. It can kind of really bounce some ideas in your head. But once you're done, then you get to know unequivocally that's your first niche. That's where we're getting you to. So trust the process. Really trust the process. This will work for you. Because next up, we're doing competitor research. And this is going deeper on the competition is good idea. Uh, in this step, you're going to look for paid ads for each niche. Now, you may need to go beyond the basic site concept. For example, road cycling gear versus road cycling. Now, this is going to make sense when you go to Google and you search it. If you just search road cycling, there's a lot of like, what is it and how does it work type content. But if you look for road cycling gear, that's when you unload and unlock the, the realization that there is a ton of gear around the world of road cycling. And we all probably already knew that because you see them all decorated like, um, you know, in the way on the roads, trying to ride their bikes on, on mountain roads, wearing their peacock outfits, um, just endangering everyone around. Uh, but that's how they roll. Um, so here is the Google ad research example. You can see up top, I went to Google and I typed in road cycling gear. Again, I tried road cycling first, nothing came up. So I adapted and I typed in road cycling gear. And what you can see here is above the fold, there are literally seven paid ads. The big circled area, I got that arrow inside there that shows you this is a sponsored ad section. These are actually website. These are actually e-commerce sites. So something you can do is you can actually go into them and you can scroll the bottom, see if they have affiliate programs, right? This is a great way to find affiliate programs. Cause if, if an e-commerce shop is paying money to get traffic here, they might be willing to pay you for any sales that you generate, but that's kind of a side note. Now below you notice we've got the word ad in a little green box next to the URL. I'm talking about the two text results below the shopping results. It says road cycling gear, competitive cyclists, and you can see right where that arrow is pointed, it says add. And then below performance cycling gear, right where that arrow is pointed, it says add. This proves beyond a shadow of a doubt there there is a lot of merch. There's a lot being sold and people are making enough sales that they're willing to invest money right? Pay per click. They're willing to pay for clicks, which means if you grow an audience and you're able to drive clicks through the content you create, there's a lot of value. There's so much value that someone would be willing to pay you for said clicks. It might be on a paper action or a paper acquisition type thing, right? You get paid a commission when you make a sale. Ultimately, you're still getting a specific amount of earning per click you send them. So this is a good sign and this is what you want to find. So when you find the niches that you can't find any Google ads on, remove them from your list. If no one can pay to get that going, right? If no one's paying for ads in order to get clicks, that means they're probably not making much money or any money in that space. And that is a big, big sign right there. That is a red flag and you're looking for red flags right now. So an optional 
process is to do product research at this exact same time, which is the next type of research. And since you're searching these things over and over, I'm going to go back real quick. You could clearly see that cycle jerseys make really good sense. But if you just click on any one of those different websites, you'll see really quickly what the different types of gear are. You could see the gear categories in there and knowing whether there's high ticket products and low ticket products on that is really, really powerful, right? Because if you're making a 5% commission and you sell a $2,000 product versus a $20 product, that's a big time difference in what you've got going on. So when you find great ads, take a minute to click through and look at the different items they're selling. Take quick notes, right? You could just say like clothing, bike parts, gear, complete bikes. What are they actually selling from the ad, right? Not, not if you click through three or four links in the navigation, where do you end up? What are they actually selling from the ad itself? It's also good to note down, like I said, price ranges, right? So when you go in through the uh, cycle gear and you look, you're like, okay, I've got a $17 shirt and I can find a $4,000 bike all after one click from the search engines. Wow, that means these people are selling everything from a $17 product to a $4,000 product from a click. And again, those are the kinds of commissions that are gonna make big, big, big time deals for you as an affiliate marketer moving forward, but you have to build the audience so you can drive the clicks, which is what, we'll, what we're ultimately going towards. We just need to know which niche to focus that attention on. And remember, the goal is still to remove niche ideas from your list. Um, it is more important for you to identify the niches that will not work, that have no commercial viability right now. Um, but, but again, it, it can save you a little bit of time to take a quick note on the products being sold. Um, so go through and do the Google research at this point. Then we're going to do Facebook ad research. So just like we did on Google, you want to go now see if people are advertising on Facebook. And you just go up to the top of the search bar inside of Facebook, type in your niche and notice I'm doing road cycling again here. I'm not doing road cycle gear because because the way that the search engine Google works compared to the way that the uh, social media network works is we want to stay topical on the social media network and we want to stay um, problem solution or you know on, on the search engines, right? The, the, the user behavior is different, which is why we're treating them different. So type in road cycling up top, click on pages. It's going to come up with a list of pages. Now you notice I've circled the, I love road cycling. Now this is a total hack for you. The, there was a, an internet marketer who taught a method. He sold a course and he taught a method of go create an, I love whatever that niche is Facebook fan page, build up an audience of people through the, I love blank fan page. And then number one, sell them products. And number two, sell a low price monthly membership called a VIP club. Now, I've seen this done, if you look up, uh, this is done a lot in the gun world. So Sig Sawyer is a brand of handgun, Glock is a brand of handgun. So if you go to Facebook and you, you search for like, I love my Sig Sawyer, I love my Glock, um, you'll see more of these types of pages. And when you're looking for, and, and I mentioned those because you can go in and look at their offerings and I'll show you how to do that here soon. But as you're doing your niche research, if you see a page that is the I love whatever that niche is, that is a really good sign that an internet marketer has gone after that. And you want to look, are they, do they have a big fan page? Are they still actively posting? Is it still active? Because it is for them. You've just proven there's the first mouse and there is some cheese available for you there. So we're now on road cycling with a search. We clicked on pages to really identify the pages. And we're going to go inside of multiple of these. I'm going to show you one example. You don't want to stop with one. You want to look through several of these. And we're going to go inside of the I love road cycling because I know that they were taught by a digital marketer how to kind of um, essentially sell things and make money online. So we're going to reverse engineer what they've been doing. So here we are on the I love road cycling page and I just click through. So I scroll down a little bit and you're going to notice there's three areas I'm linking to here that show they are monetizing the heck out of this page. We're going to start on the far right under our story. And it says, have you enrolled in the VIP club yet? That's a monthly membership. I think they usually charge something like $9 a month to get in the secret group. And that's where, you know, the insiders talk about, there's nothing, they don't sell anything. There's actually no value at all. Like sometimes they'll give you a free like keychain or something ridiculously dumb. Um, but it's, it's literally people paying to be on an inner circle group. Um, then there's the shop. So
Okay, quick update for you since Facebook changed their interface as well. Uh, you'll notice that the items for sale are not showing up on the fan page anymore, and we don't have that info and ads tab anymore. So you scroll down on the right side, you see the page transparency. You simply click see more, and what it's going to load is this pop-up box that when you scroll down, you'll see ads from this page. And it says this page is currently running ads. It would say is not currently running ads if they didn't have ads. And when you click to the go to ad library, it essentially loads their page on the ad library and you can see every single advertisement that they're currently running. Now this ad library, I have a full video that teaches how to use it. Um, it's one of the, the most powerful free market research tools available on the market today because you could see exactly where they're running ads for today. But remember, if they turn these ads off or if they rotate to different ads tomorrow or next week, um, you're only gonna see what's running live in the moment and advertisers are always turning on things and turning them off. So when I clicked on the ad, it takes me here to their actual landing page. And this is where I can start to dig in and see the other items that they're also selling. So you can see these are the, the bike components that they're selling. So we can see the, the items themselves. And then the jerseys, the hoodies, the print on demand stuff, etc, etc. Uh, the research potential from these two tools in Facebook's to the ad library, and then looking on their site is quite profound. And on that note, I'm going to let you get back into the video. And this is where you can see what they're selling what price point, what they're advertising, and are they selling one product or many? So now I'm on their info and ads and I scrolled down a little bit. So you can see they're selling this, this bike seat, this fancy bike seat. I would click on the shop now button. I would go look at their offer. Is this a free plus shipping offer? Is this take me to a shopping cart? Is this a sales page? I would, my internal marketer would be trying to reverse engineer. What are they doing? Because when you do this research over and over and over for the different niches, or even in the same niche, you're going to notice the patterns. And then you have a really good survey of what's working for other people, which will help you get to money more quickly once you have built your audience. So then if you scroll down, you can see get weekly pointers and tips too. So that next ad that I've got the circle around, they're actually um, the I Love Road Cycling. That's where they're actually promoting their VIP. So you could click on that ad and see the sales letter for their VIP program. So this is how you can do ad-based research in Facebook. You've never really been able to do that, do this uh, for at all. It was never easy until very, very recently, I think maybe two months ago. Um, so maybe August of 2018, they actually added this info and ads tab. Um, and you can kind of search on it there. So this is the other place you want to go look for the ads. Um, and now you need to go complete the competitor research. And this is going to be one of the longer aspects of this training um, because you've got a lot of niche ideas and you need to go through and eliminate ones that you cannot find lots of great ads, lots of high ticket, mid ticket, low ticket products being sold by other people. Because if other people aren't selling it and they're not building the audiences and their communities aren't getting engagement, the odds are you're not going to be able to either. And it's really good to know that up front. It's really neat, good to know that before you spend two, three years of energy working on a project that you have no data that says it's even merchantably viable, right? So that's what you want to do here. So eliminate the niches that have no Google ads, eliminate the niches that have no Facebook ads, take notes on what products are being sold and at what price points. If you want, start your swipe file now, copy down headlines, ad copy, take notes on or you can actually just take a note on the different fan page names that have lots of really good ads. And then you can go back if it matches the research on the next step. You want to be quick through this, right? The goal is still to shorten your list. Um, you don't need to do extensive, exhaustive research yet. You can do that in the future. We're still working to eliminate these. We will still eliminate other ones over time based on the data we get out. But really the goal at this point for you is to just kind of shorten your list down to where you've got it to where not only have you taken time to dig deep and think this is something that would interest me. This is something that kind of captivated me. I have some connection with this in my life from phase one. But then you went and found, is there a community here? There is. And then you went and found, is there some sort of merchantability here? And there is. So you want to come up with a shorter list. Your, your list will be very short at this point. I'm hoping you're down to three to six, maybe eight different niche ideas at this point before we're going to move on to the next one. So more product research is able to be done though because you want to search to see if there's any memberships or information courses that you're able to promote as an affiliate. This is where you can search for ClickBank share sale or offer vault. 
Now I have a YouTube video already up that'll show you how to find great offers for great offers from ClickBank and how to find uh, offers from other affiliate networks. This is really the the highest margin type product you can sell are the information based products. So you can just go to um, ClickBank and you're able to search under the categories for outdoor sports and then you click on cycling and you can see that there's a few different cycling offers available. Um, know that you don't have to have information-based courses on every single niche in order to make it viable. It is possible to build a business based off of physical products, but it is gonna be more common in the problem solution world to find information-based courses and memberships than it is in the, um, you know, possibly in the fishing world. You'll see a lot of lures, a lot of fishing poles, a lot of physical products, a lot less information products, doesn't mean there's not a possibility for selling information products. It's just kind of the natural flow of that niche itself. Then you want to search for categories of products on Amazon and in the big stores. In theory, you already maybe even found some of these niches from that search. So you maybe don't have to reproduce that, but you can. And it's worth taking time to make sure that on Amazon, you can find an actual product, like a category page that not only has products, but it's got subcategories full of products. And when you find a category like road cycling, there's going to be a bunch of subcategories. There's going to be bikes, there's going to be clothes, there's going to be tires, there's going to be, you know, all of these different categories. And then under those, there's individual products. And this will tell you quickly at a glance from Amazon page, there's probably hundreds and hundreds of different products you could review over the years from that. So then you want to search for your niche comma affiliate. This is how you can find the different types of offers that are available for you to promote as an affiliate that aren't on a network. Um, anyone who sells via Infusionsoft, which is a really, really common tool for um, high-end professional internet marketing companies, um, they won't be listed on your average ClickBank or ShareSale. They're going to be managing their affiliate program in-house, and the only way to find it is to actually, you know, search for road cycle gear comma affiliate, and then go scroll. You can find it on page, and then you go down to the bottom, you click on the affiliate link, and it'll actually take you inside, and they'll tell you about their program, how much you can earn, the different products they sell, etc. And then finally, what have you bought? You know, back to that original idea of what have you bought and where have you bought for? Are there affiliate programs for there? So if you purchase on REI a lot, you're into backpacking, you're into the outdoors and camping, and you want to go in that direction, you just scroll to the bottom of REI and you'll see there's an affiliate link and they actually run their affiliate program, I think through two networks. Um, AventLink is a great affiliate network, um, A-V-A-N-T-L-I-N-K.com. Um, they are access to a lot of outdoor sports, uh, the road cycling stuff you, you would find if you go to AventLink, there's they have probably the best of the best affiliate programs for physical products for outdoor retailers. Um, backcountry.com, uh, yeah, all kinds of them. Um, Moose Jaw, REI, Sierra Trading Post, etc. So, we're at the point where you need to complete the research. We are about to part, my friend. We are one slide away after this before you are just going to dig in. You're going to roll up your sleeves. You're going to put on some awesome music that pumps you up, that gets you fired up, and you're going to put in the work because those who put in the work get rewarded and you're going to whittle this list down. You're going to take this branch and you're going to whittle it down to a toothpick and you're going to find those, the goal, I think the goal is to come up with three. Three that you're just like, wow, these have booming communities, all kinds of products to promote. They look really exciting. Um, don't force yourself to list down to three. If you end up with a list of 12 or 15 or seven, great. We can You can do the next level research where we get into the numbers on all of them, but you need to have at least three for this next step. Uh, you do want to know which ones have information products available. That is potentially a really um, big step up. Uh, most of the weight loss world, the fitness world is going to have that as well. In, in the investing world, there's a lot of options there as well. Um, you want to note which niches have a few products and which have a lot of products. As we were saying with Amazon, right? Do they have a category full of subcategories full of products? Like that is a huge opportunity for you because there's so many review based pieces of content you can create over time. And again, Remove the niche ideas that have very few affiliate products or they only have low price products available. If all you can find is $20 products, $20, $25 products, and that's it, um, generally with the cost of goods sold, with the cost of shipping, with the cost of everything, there's not going to be a lot in the room of margins for you as an affiliate. Um, so you do want to see some of the 50, 100, 200, 500, 
thousand dollar products and they're out there i guarantee you can find a fly fishing rod and reel setup that costs you know 1500 bucks or more i know those guys spend a lot of money on those tools golf clubs are the same way you can find a you know 1800 hundred dollar driver for sure um, but you can also find a 200 hundred dollar driver and that's where reviews come in very very handy um so right now we're wrapping this up you need to go finalize your niche brainstorm and you need to take all of the remaining possible niche ideas. And if you haven't already move them over to spreadsheet or a word document so we can get going on the next steps with them. You want to choose the top three. Even if you have a list of seven or 12 or 15, you want to select three that you're ready to move forward with on the next level. Um, make sure you whittle your list down to where you've only got 12 or whatever to choose from, but then we'll, we'll choose three and that's where I'll meet you on the next video. I'm gonna show you how to use this new tool to really get the, the data. And you can obviously use this tool for more than three, right? It takes up to three different niches at a time. It's a really cool tool. It's the only tool I know that will allow you to um, essentially like put three totally different niche ideas against each other. So you can like literally in one screen put like fishing and photography and you can see which one has better numbers, right? The supply and the demand and, and the profitability. And you can actually get data on very, very different ideas. We're going to get into that on part two. Um, you need to choose your next three here. And then we're going to jump in on that on part two. So I'll see you on the next video so we can go get these niche ideas that you've really run down. And we're going to be able to find the search volume and the profitability numbers so you can let the data really guide you. But again, you have to do the work. If you're not doing the work, don't expect it to work for you, right? Like those who create success online are those who take the time to spend the afternoon or whatever it takes to do the work. If you're just watching this video, you jump in and watch the next one. Great. Realize that's not actually going to help you unless you actually put in the work and do the work. So the work for you now is to take this big old messy list that you created and keep refining it. Keep removing the ones that prove they don't have communities. They don't have products available. No one's running ads in those spaces. Great. Get those off of your list. Then bring it back together and we'll meet on part two to go through that list deeper. But be sure you take a moment to at least put a star next to the ones that you were like, I really like that. I would really like to be in that niche or highlight them if you're on a spreadsheet. Whatever it is you need to do, identify the ones that you feel like would be more fun for you because this business can be fun right? You could spend three to five years playing with things that you like, sharing things that you like, talking about, writing about, being on video about things that you enjoy anyways. And ultimately you can grow an audience, you can grow a list, you can grow their trust and you can sell products and make money doing something you love. It's really, really cool. So if you have a bigger list than three, identify the, the three that you're really excited about that, that just seem fun and meet me on part two, where we'll go into that next tool. I'll show you around that whole interface. I'll show you how to use it. I'll show you how to do the deep dive research. We'll not only choose your niche, I'm going to help you put together a master keyword list. So you'll have your entire roadmap for that new niche. So you'll know exactly what needs to get done. You'll have your roadmap for your 90 day challenge. And literally you will be able to kick into high gear after that next video. But first complete your research, do the work. And I'm really excited to help you get this going. Cause once you get that right niche, once you really have the the overlap of your heart, you know, your passion, and then the data and everything confirms like that's my niche. And you know that that's your niche and you're excited to just blaze forward with it, man, the, the universe rearranges things for you. That's when we start creating our luck. We create luck through our action and you take action when you're confident. And that's what we're doing here is we're taking time to do the research so you can get really, really confident on what your niche is. So you can turn the page on this. You could stop doubting and wondering and thinking about this tough question because it is a tough question for so many of us. But once you turn that page and you get into action and you start building and you start creating and you start giving value to others, oh, you're going to love it because that's when momentum happens. That's when the traffic happens. Your list grows. Your money starts to come in. That's when the magic happens and we create our own luck through doing the work. So I'll call it at this point. Thank you again very much for your time. And I look forward to connecting with you on the next video. Until then, be well and get the work done. I'll see you on part two.